and welcome to an interview with Philip Snow, the co-author of the new book, Miracles and Wonders, a meandering cacophonous concordance of the Jazz Butcher Songbook. My name is Brian Kelly, and I'll be conducting the interview today. Philip Snow once apologized to Pat that he worked for the government, guzzled gas, and ate meat. He's still a knowledge and information management professional working in government, but he's taken his foot off the gas and no longer munches on the flesh of other species. Philip wrote a ghost story, The Dutch Doll, in 2007, and a biography of Victorian writer Jesse Saxby in Tales from Wolver's Hool in 2018. Beyond his current obsession with the Jazz Butcher Conspiracy, Philip is planning to be kept awake nights further pondering on the subject of polar explorer, explorer Peter Freuken. He lives in Kettering, or as Pat would say, Ketamine, NN15. Please welcome my guest, Philip Snow. Welcome, sir. Hi. Yeah, good to see you. At the top, I mentioned your previous books. Uh, tell us a little bit about your experience as an author and uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself. So, uh, so I live in Northamptonshire, about 14 miles from Fishy Mansions, uh, which is a long way in England, not very far in the US, I appreciate, but 14 miles is a fairly long way in the UK. And uh, I was comprehensively educated in a way that Pat was classically educated, or uh, he would certainly say, or you would certainly describe him as being classically educated. He was a... Uh, a master of language, as you probably know, and and a lover of antiquity. Uh, I, you know, also like history. Um, but when I say comprehensively educated, that's an oxymoron. That's a Southern Mark Smith sort of phrase. Uh, someone who uh, would say that they went to what in uh, the UK is called a comprehensive school was is not necessarily comprehensively educated. Uh, so I didn't go to university as Pat did, uh, and I'm sort of self-educated as a writer. I'm a career civil servant, so that's my day job. And uh, as you read, read from the blurb on, in the back of the book, uh, I, uh, I work um, currently for the Department for Education in the UK as a knowledge and information management professional. So knowledge and information is my thing uh, professionally. And that sort of comes out in these rather obsessive books. It seems unlikely that anybody watching this would be unfamiliar with the work of the Jazz Butcher. But in the interest of due diligence, uh, tell me a little bit about Pat Fish, who he was, uh, and the importance and significance of the Jazz Butcher conspiracy as a band, as you see it. Well, I think Pat corrected uh, uh, a fan when I quoted to him once. Um, uh, someone, I think, in the comments under a YouTube clip to one of his songs said, probably the best band in the world, which I would not dispute, but Pat did. You know, Pat said, mm, the last time I looked, we were only the 36th best band in the world. <laughs> and uh, and I, think, I think that I put them, I put them, you know, high up amongst, amongst, um, popular music, you know, in terms of how I see their, um, the weight of, of the music that Pat and the Jazz Butcher produced. Um, you know, Pat and the Jazz Butcher were interchangeable in that you and I know he was the leading light of the Jazz Butcher conspiracy. And there were lots of co-conspirators, band members who came in and, and went. Uh, and there were probably about four or five major incarnations of the band. But I think I listed all of the players, uh, and, I, and, I, and I'm pretty sure they were getting on for a hundred people who played with Pat on the recorded output or went on tour with with, with Pat. The, the music is really hard to categorize, and I think he would uh, he would rail against, he would resist being categorized. Uh, he certainly didn't like the, the term indie. Uh, and and uh, through the book, you will see, if you get to read it, that uh, we, we refer to indie in tiny, tiny font. It's, mm. it's insignificant and it's not something we want to label ourselves as. Um, he said he wasn't new wave and like, likewise, you know, popular music. You couldn't say that his music is popular because, it, because you, need to sell, you need to sell a decent number of records to be popular. He did sell a fair number of records, but he was always under the radar, really, in terms of mainstream popularity. 
you know so so there's 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 a beauty to much much that he did and you know i, I like you i'm sure Ryan. i just i i, I love a lot of it is his output you know it, no. it's just it's, it, it just moves you, doesn't it? So, some, some of his songs, some of his songs are meant to be throwaway and they're meant to be silly, but some of them are so moving, you know, and that's what, and that's what, um, that's what grabs our attention. The, the few hundred really diehard jazz butcher fans around the world. That's what, that's what grabs our attention. The fact that these songs uh, are lasting and, and deep and moving. Yeah. So I, so I think the, the, there is that Bauhaus connection. And if you come from this part of the world in England, then you, you know you're aware of Bauhaus and you, and you might have followed them in the early 80s, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and then you were looking somewhere up for somewhere else to take your attention, as, as, as I did, as many of us did. And, uh, and you find the Jazz Butcher and you, and you find that they did, they did good work and you follow them and you continue to buy their records. And I, and I, I did see um, the Jazz Butcher out live quite a few times in London and in Northampton. And then I think as, as many of us did, we sort of, we might have, um, well, we, we got on and had our lives, didn't we? And we, we, uh, we had our kids and we did things like that, you know? And, and maybe some of us came back to the Jazz Butcher in, in the 21st century, as I did more seriously. And I think David Whitmore's um, brilliant um, website um, helped with that. And by that stage, he was playing a lot of local gigs um you know and quite often if he had a gig in in um in rugby which which is between his house no it's the other side his house is between mine and rugby then i would say well i i'll take you because as you know he didn't drive so he'd, he'd have to get on a bus or a train if he wanted to go to a gig or he'd get a lift from someone and i became one of the people who would give him a lift but from then on we um definitely became more like friends he would definitely say you know my pal philip or my friend philip i i was always slightly hesitant about that because you know we crossed the 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 the, the fan friend um threshold with hesitancy don't we i think there's some uh, uh um concern i think wouldn't you say that pat was kind of unique in that he allowed access to his fans that a lot of fans otherwise wouldn't he would be, you know, quite um, realistic about his his stature in the industry, as it were. But also, um, you know, there are many uh, less successful acts who who would be much more uh, precious about about how they how they deal with the people who are fans of their work. You know, let me ask you. There seems to be a bit of serendipity uh, prior to his passing. Obviously, the release of the fire uh, box sets um, and the posthumous release of Highest in the Land, which he went into saying to people around him that he had sort of perceived as a last album. Um, and then this book, th th there seems to be sort of uh, an effort to encapsulate his legacy that even preceded his passing. Um, was that something that you and he discussed in terms of why, why now uh, for the book? Not, not necessarily. Um, and I think, uh, I, I think first of all, he allowed me to start to do the work with him. Um, so it was just a matter of chance in terms of timing. But also, I think I did feel that um, this was just after the cancer diagnosis. And um, uh, I had a feeling that, you know, this guy is not going to live forever. And, and uh, his life style was such that um, someone needed to try and capture some of this. OK, there have been interviews and he's written stuff of his own. But the core purpose of his life was to make music. Uh, and so it wasn't natural for him to write um, books or to write um, stories, even though I know that he was sort of technically really able, as, as I say, classically educated, a, a master of language. And so, you know, I felt very much his inferior during the course of the writing of this because I'm self-taught, you know, and, and I have a sort of gut feel for whether something's looks decent or not on paper. Uh, so 
so I, I think um, I, I wanted to do it. Um, and I sensed that, as I think he did, there was, there's, there's an element of foreboding about his own mortality. But then I think he had that feeling when he was, when he was um, recording the previous, the penultimate album, Last of the Gentleman Adventurers. Um, I think uh, he certainly says in the book, that when they're recording the last track or, or the last um, piece of music on that album, there's this feeling of, will I, will I make another album, you know? And, and actually, I think he thought, um, even when uh, Highest in the Land was finished, in that sort of six weeks between finishing that album and him dying, I still think he had in mind, uh, well, maybe it's not my last. Tell us a little bit about the writing process and the approach that you and Pat took to writing together. The, the writing essentially consisted of um, 16 very long conversations that we taped uh, uh, on the subject of each of the albums and actually one for the introduction on the subject of one song, which we'll get on to. Um, so these, these quite long conversations, there's probably about 50 hours worth of, of conversations, which I then tra I, I transcribed into three or 400,000 words. And then I pared down and, and Pat and I turned that uh, recorded conversation into prose. And I think he struggled with that. I say in the author's note, you know, he struggled with the sheer weight of the words. I struggled with his, with his exact exactness, his, his, his um, need to be perfect. And I, I think I respected that as well because it's his work, you know, it's his intellectual property as it were. But I think if, if you were to, if you were to say, well, what was the division of labor? You would say, well, Pat, we owe Pat, you know, 90% uh, of the inspiration of this. 90% um, of the perspiration is probably me. Um, Pat, Pat, did, uh, Pat did a certain amount of the, convert of, of the actual writing and we did exchange emails and some of his actual writings in. A lot of his words are in because the transcript of the, of the conversations are him speaking, him talking about each of the songs. So throughout the book is, um, you know, as I say, in, again, in the author's note, hopefully you'll hear his voice throughout. Given his untimely passing, how much of the new album were you and he able to cover together? I certainly wanted to return to him after the recording of The Highest in the Land to get his take on what that album was about. But I did do some sort of preemptive work on The Highest in the Land as well. In the last conversation, like formal conversation we had about the book, um, we went through some of the songs that were in in the making, in, in the formation, and some of them were, were quite uh, rough and uh, quite early versions of those songs. And as I say, other songs as well that were being considered that never made it. So um, I did get some descriptions from him about the last album. And also I mentioned again in the book that I was sort of slightly worried about the last chapter of the book um, because I was concerned there wasn't any really enough from Pat about that. Uh, but, uh, but Lee, the producer of the last album, again, came up trumps because Pat had shared notes about each of the songs um, to help with the, to help with the produ production notes essentially for each of the songs, which give a bit of a uh, description of the mood, but also um, the inspiration and a little bit of explanation about some of some of the some of the lyrics as well. So that really, so from beyond the grave, I had I had also help um, in terms of collaboration on the book. But it was was um, I think you would say we struggled. I think between us trying to write um, together, and I think only uh, and maybe the book may not have been released had he been alive. I'd much rather he was alive, by the way, but actually, but actually, him him dying gave me the impetus to finish it and publish it in maybe a slightly imperfect state that Pat would not have been entirely happy with. But I think I owe it to the people out there that you know I was carrying this this thing that really would would have been a disservice to have just kept to myself. So because because it does answer five hundred questions, it might pose another hundred it may it may leave another thousand unanswered but it answers a lot of those little questions about the songs and what inspired them and what was behind them you know from what i understand the book approaches the songs 
fairly chronologically, uh, but not necessarily uh, song by song, line by line, what each line, each lyric means. Although there are, you know, these fairly atomic uh, detailed descriptions of the songs, there's also, you know, there are also stories and there are, and, and, and we did digress into, well, what happened between that last album and this? And where did you go? And what did you see? And we said, well, those were for cultural, cultural context, you know, for what comes next. And, uh, and I think that works quite well because also the sort of famous thing about, about Pat and the Jazz Butcher is, and he said this, quite often, didn't he? You'll, you'll probably recognize this, that, you know, they're all true stories. They're all about true, real things that happened. You know, I, I will routinely, and certainly this happened in the, in the late eighties and nineties, I will routinely go to America and Europe and other places and I'll see things and I'll come home and I'll write, write those things down and turn them into songs and sell them back to the people with whom I was having these experiences, you know? I understand you start the book with a song called Wildlife, which you view as a particularly important uh, song, even though it's not featured on any Jazz Butcher album, uh, it actually appeared on a compilation album called That's What I Call Northampton, Volume 1. Uh, I don't think there ever was a Volume 2. Uh, why start there? Tell us a little bit about that song. I think it's significant because it's, it's, it, it reminisces. It talks about a certain group of people at a certain time, and uh, I think the lyric, one of the lyrics is the songs is re remembering people I have known, you know, mm -hmm. it's about, it's about people he has known. And, and I think it's significant, but it's also really funny. It tells a lot of funny stories about um, um, the, the, the bands that they came across in an apart, apart hotel in Los Angeles in, in the summer of 88. So they're sharing this hotel with, a, with, with bands that that the Jazz Butcher both detest and adore. So on the one hand, Guns N' Roses, and on the other hand, Public Enemy. And, and the, song, the song lyrics again talk about in a, in a swimming pool with Chuck and Flav. So, and, and Pat and Kizzy are actually swimming with Public Enemy, you know? Mm. At the same time, deriding and being abusive towards Guns N' Roses. And I think that sort of, that sort of sums up um, the Jazz Butcher in, in some ways, you know, um, certainly shunning uh, uh, the, the, the Midwest rock display, as they call Guns N' Roses, you know? Let's actually delve into the individual songs, uh, and maybe you can even read a few passages from the book. Uh, we've got some uh, requests for information from folks from the uh, Facebook page, uh, but we'll get to that in a minute. But let's actually start with uh, the first song, Pat Ever Wrote. He got quite late into playing guitar, I think. Um, but he, he, he mentioned, besides South America being the very first song that he wrote, that the second song he wrote, um, if you like, on a, using a guitar, was, um, uh, was Party Time. So this is about, it's about drugs. Well, it starts off as a story about drugs anyway, and his friend, Anti, the Antichrist. So uh, Anti didn't have any drugs, but he knew a man who did. Uh, he said, look, you stop here, Fishy, and I'll go piling out and see if I can't find us something to smoke. Uh, and then he went off and I was left alone in his room. Uh, he was gone an unfeasibly long time. I remember listening to Dare by The Human League, which had just come out and thinking, blimey, that's different. Then I remember getting really bored and tried to sniff some glue. And, and still Antti had not returned. And out of total boredom, I picked up his acoustic guitar. I couldn't really play guitar, but I just heard a record called The Rich Get Rich um, on, on the John Peel show, all, all in major seventh, sevenths. And then he bashed it out. And so party time appeared. Um, and he said it just fell out. And that's how he wrote his first song in a student gig, digs, I guess, in, in Oxford, um, waiting for a guy to come back um, with his drugs. 
Another song that's asked about a lot, uh, in part because it seems a bit uh, disjointed and obtuse, but mostly, I think, because it just contains so much, is Caroline Wheeler's birthday presents. Let's talk a little bit about Caroline Wheeler, shall we? It's actually about a letter I received from a chap, chap called Cameron Lindo, who was in a band called In Embrace. You might, you might be familiar with In Embrace. Uh, Caroline was uh, was Cameron's girlfriend, and uh, and Cameron wrote him a very 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 long letter, uh, describing and detailing the things that he'd bought for Caroline Wheeler's birthday. What can you tell us about the song Sweetwater? Uh, certainly, there's a little shout out to Dave J and his song Hoagie Carmichael Never Came to New Orleans. But uh, uh, what is that song about? The sweet water in question is a bar, uh, and we had a, a very agreeable evening there, and it, it ended with us being locked in the, a gigantic fridge. It was a bike, biker's bar, um, but we'd, we'd had enough clout in the area that it didn't fill up with bikers, it filled up with people who wanted to see us. Uh, the, guy, the guys who ran it were obviously quite intrigued by these European fops. Uh, I can remember being uh, at the bar quite early in the evening, surprisingly. Uh, it wasn't quite our, Ameri our usual American gig. Uh, it was much smaller and down home, uh, but better than a night off, he thought. Uh, quite early in the evening, I was talking to one of the barmen and he said, I've heard you British guys like your beer, but how are you with your hot liquor? Um, and, and Pat said, uh, have you any Jägermeister? So, uh, and then closing time came at two o'clock a lot of things happened at two o'clock in the morning and a lot of things happened at two o'clock in the morning in Jazz Butcher Song. That must just be a magical hour, I think. But by two o'clock, they, they'd shut down because it was a small place in California with busy, nosy police. Uh, and, and the only place you could continue drinking uh, because by then we were on an absolute bender with those guys and we'd shown what we could do with hot liquor and, and it was becoming very messy. Uh, the only place we could continue drinking was in their gigantic walk-in freezer. Uh, we we're all having a freezer party. Uh, Twelve people crammed in with the door closed shut. It, it was like an episode from the Avengers. It could have gone horribly wrong. It could have ended really badly. Actually, it, re it ended really well, Pat says. One of our Facebook members asks about Tough Priest uh, off the album Rotten Soul. Who is the Tough Priest in question? So, um, Tough, uh, the Rotten Soul album, as you as you may know, um, was a I think a two thousand album where Max re Max Ida returns as as the guitarist. You know, um, uh, uh, Max, uh, co-founder of the Jazz Butcher Conspiracy, uh, features on the first uh, four or five albums, um, but then uh, leaves the band um, for a few a few albums worth of material. Um, is still out playing with Pat at times in the 90s, but actually doesn't return to playing on records until, until 2000. And Rotten Soul, I think by Pat and Max's admission, is one done on a budget, you know? Yeah. It's recorded in Peter Crouch's back bedroom. Uh, Crouchy, as we refer to him throughout the book, I think Pat refers to him as Crouchy quite often. You know, his drinking buddy from the 90s. Um, and when they come to have the opportunity to make this um, this album with Vinyl Japan, the record the record company at the time. Uh, they they recorded it in Crouch's back bedroom on Crouch's home recording equipment, and Pat talks about the frustration of this home recording equipment and trying to get the EQ, trying to get the levels of music on the album right. Um, Whilst, whilst Crouch goes off and does his day job with British Airways, you know? And, uh, but Tough Priest is, of course, obviously, about uh, Augusto Pinochet, the, the, uh, uh, the dictator and murderer of Chile. Um, again, I'll, I'll read a little bit. So I take the train down to Crouch's in Windlesham um, and about one stop away from Windlesham, there was a station called Sunningdale, and the, and the town is the home of the famous golf club, um, at the edge of which was a lux luxurious bungalow. 
in which was domiciled Augusto Pinochet, the dictator and murderer of Chile. The song is about him. Uh, in the first verse, I say, uh, you ain't going nowhere. And that was the situation. He was holder. Uh, uh, and a Spanish lawyer had brought a case against him and he couldn't go back to Chile because he was up for trial. He was stuck in this house on the edge of Sunningdale Golf Court, uh, Club. And he was just up the road from, um, from where they were recording the album. So he wrote that for him because he's a cunt. <laughs> Pat says. <laughs> But that's, but that's who he's referring to in the song when he's saying speculator, escalator, violator, liquidator, dictator, mutilator, undertaker, contaminator. That's all about this South American dictator. A song that I think has become very dear to the fans in a very short amount of time is Never Give Up uh, off the new album, Highest in the Land. Uh, and I know that you didn't get to talk to Pat about all of the songs and some were in development, but, huh, but uh, Never Give Up has been around for quite some time. So I have to imagine that you had an opportunity to talk to him a bit about that song. We, cer we certainly covered Never Give Up and we, we actually covered probably all but about three of the songs, which I sort of had to fill in the gaps for. Um, but, but I got most of them, I, I, I'd say. Never Give Up, um, I talked about, because I'd heard it played out live, and I, talk, I talked about the fact that it contains a sparkle in the guitar notes. And I'm not a musician, I don't know music. Um, so um, I didn't know quite what that was. Um, and it appears after uh, he sings, because you don't know me. And, and that says, that's just C, B flat, A, um, to a non-musician's ear, it might come across as overwhelming, um, but when you play it out, um, he plays it out with a little shimmer that he uses on the analog delay, um, but it's like a call and response thing. But, but Pat said when he was playing the song to me in that last session that he and I had about the songs that were coming up for the last album, he said that it was quite old at the time. It, 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 it belongs of a piece to With Mercy and Shaky. It comes from about 2010, that sort of period. Uh, and Max, Max noticed it when he played it in 2010 at the Constitution Pub in London. Um, and he toured with it and played it occasionally with the quartet when they were playing in France in 2015. Uh, and, and, but actually didn't come to finish the song until he came up with this idea of book, book ending the song with never give up and that repeating phrase of never give up. Um, and he said it came to a real moment when he, and he knew he was winning when he devised the tale, never give up until you want to, you know, which, which he says still puts a shiver down my spine now, you know. So that's, that's the killer line, never give up until you want to. And he said he actually practiced the end uh, he practiced until you want to, and then staring down the, the audience, really. Um, and he, he studied <coughs> and selected the notes uh, and considered alternatives, little details like that, that appear to be a shrug of the shoulder, but disguise how much goes, goes into it. And then he practices actually standing still and staring down the audience before leaving, you know, um, because it demands that. Uh, unusually considered, he says, for him. And he talks about, um, this is where we diverge from um, all the songs being true stories. You know, he says, uh, I never really pissed down my own stairs. Um, but the level, of, the level of disintegration in the song suggests that kind of behavior. Um, uh, and, and he talks about the song um, moving from romantic to being a little confrontational. Um, you don't know me. Um, you don't know me, it's not Condition Blue. You know, he's referencing back to the old album title where he was talking about Miss X, another relationship, and this other um, uh, difficult time he's having. Um, uh, you don't know me, and it's maybe best you never do. Well, since we kind of started at the beginning uh, with the first song that Pat ever wrote, I think it's only fair to look to the last album and the last track on the last album Goodbye, Sweetheart. Um, what can you tell us about Goodbye, Sweetheart? Uh, he played me a bit when, when we had that last session. He, uh, he said, um, this is an ending in search of a song. 
Now, um, I don't want to presuppose what or what he's referring to in terms of little Jake, but he talks about little Jake and I are going to take up ink and paper, write down the things that we've seen. It's been a long time due. Little Jake and I won't, don't want to leave it any later. Don't, don't be afraid of what we might say. It's too late for you anyway. And um, I think that little Jake is a cipher. Uh, he uses this expression, a cipher, quite often in the book. Um, I don't know whether it's about me. It may not be. It may, may be about something entirely different. But I think it's, it, and I use it at the start of the book. Uh, I quote from it at the start of the book because he's clearly saying, I'm, we're going to take up pen, pen and paper. We're going to tell some stories. Um, it's been a long time due. And I'd like to think he's thinking about this book. He might be, but I don't know because I didn't have a chance to ask him. Philip, I can't thank you enough for your time. Uh, this has been very enjoyable, and uh, I hope that it generates some interest in miracles and wonders. Really looking forward to reading it myself. Uh, for those who uh, have not pre-ordered it, where can people buy the book? There's a there's a little um, a little abbreviation on the title page that says, you know, this is an imprint of New Barcelona Books 2022 via the JBSTSF. Now, the JBSTSF can mean two things. It can mean either the Jeff Bezos Space Tourism Slush Fund. So you can order it from Amazon. Uh, and, and I won't hold it against you if you do. It's on Amazon. You can look it up. You can buy it from there. Um, but it can also mean, and this is a bit of a backronym, I figured out another, another way of interpreting the JBSTSF. It's the Jazz Butcher, seriously tenacious shipping family. So, so there are, there are um, little distribution centers of Jazz Butcher fans and myself, of course. So you can get in touch with me via the, Jace, uh, the, the, the Jazz Butcher Facebook group or my email address, which you can share as well. Um, and you can order direct from me. I can send it out. And that way avoid, avoids the other JBST, you know. Um, but order whichever way you like. I really hope you enjoy it and you get something from it. And, and I must say, um, I've been really um, moved by the enthusiasm of people, the 150 or so people who have pre-ordered and, and hopefully a few more hundred people will want the book going forward uh, who, who haven't ordered it as yet. Uh, but I've been really touched by people's enthusiasm and keenness to see it. I hope you. I hope it's. Uh, I hope you're pleased with it, and I hope it. It, it gives you what you want. Uh, a, a little slice of Pat, a final little sort of little insight into his mind, uh, his dark and his wonderful and his uh, his brilliantly memory filled mind. I hope you see a bit of that through the book. Well, personally, I can't wait to read the book. Uh, according to Facebook. A lot of people have been in the United States have been uh, getting their copies, so I expect mine will be here soon, and I can't wait to read it. Thank you again, uh, and uh, best of luck with Miracles and Wonders. Uh, and to our viewing audience, uh, get your copy today. Uh, thank you to Philip Snow. Brilliant. Great to see you. Good to see you, Brian. You too.